what Bill Plant hasn't really been figured out with these car no shit. This is the car that we're referring to as the retired race car. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that some of the things about this car need to be addressed. We're still in the process of the move. We still have plenty of cars at the old shop and we have some now at the new shop and it's going to take us a while to make that transition. But in the meantime, I still need to be able to work. So I'm taking the day to work down here at the new shop and make some progress on the retired race car. Now in the opening of this video, what you saw was what we refer to as very common um, rust issues that are on a great deal of GTVs. If you think about it, the rust that you saw are in areas that are traps. In other words, underneath the rear quarter window uh, trim and underneath the window sills. So the rubber windows, especially the glue in ones, tend to trap an awful lot of moisture in the corners and that's where the rust starts in the nose. Anytime a car is repainted, and you've heard me say it many a time, but anytime a car is repainted, oftentimes whoever's painting it doesn't put the membrane in between the stainless steel or chrome pieces and the paint. So what happens is, is over time, that chrome or stainless steel expands and contracts at a different rate than the rest of the car, and it creates a rubbing effect. And that rubbing eventually will erode away the paint and expose the metal, and then the metal starts to rust. It's kind of common sense when you think about it after the fact, but the truth is, if you've ever had your car resprayed, you might have these issues, or they might just be starting now. So what you should do is you probably should probably take up a piece of trim here and there and see if there was any of that uh, 3M, you've seen us use that 3M strip caulking, um, isolating the trim from the paint. If it's not there, you should probably go get you some and start doing that yourself. You'll be happy and your car will stay rust free much longer. Now the rust that you saw on this car, to the common buyer of a GTB these days, that might alarm them or scare them away. When in reality, you should be able to use that as good leverage to get a good price on the car because it's fairly easy repairs. Now I know most of you don't have welders and sheet metal fabrication equipment, but for somebody who does this stuff, it's pretty straightforward stuff for them. I'll show you how we do it today. Um, we're gonna start with some basic metal bending and the shaping we'll build it from there. So we'll get started here shortly. Okay, so the black one is the shrinker. The yellow one is the stretcher. What this does is it gathers the metal and it'll create a curvature on this piece. Now, if you have to create a curvature on a, a bend like this, you have to really plot out the design first, and this is why I say this. If this was equal length to the right angle, in other words, this is an inch and a half, and this was also an inch and a half, putting in a shrinker stretcher is gonna take a long time for it to move that metal into the curvature you're trying to create. The shorter one angle is versus the other, the more accelerated that action is, because it has a full bite on less surface versus a full bite on greater surface. Um, I know that's probably sounding a little confusing, but I'll just demonstrate what this is gonna do for you. Okay, so I've already pre-lined this. This is for the passenger side rear quarter window. I've already pre-measured out where I need this to be. Okay, so fully up against the rest, and I'm taking bites and then gradually moving it along. And I'm studying how that curvature is being created. Because if you get exaggerated on it, you can always stretch it back out some. This is what we call the orientation bite. In other words, it's a full bite. And I'll probably be using a full bite. When I say full bite, meaning the metal is fully rested against the product. Or the machine, I should say. Okay, it's starting to really curve now. Okay, so you see now that I'm starting to get my curvature right here, okay? Now, I could really accelerate that action if I just nipped it. In other words, if I just did partially set it in and bit it, okay? But the problem with that action is, is you start to get an unusual kinking down at the bottom. We're trying to avoid that. We need to make this piece of metal look just like the factory piece that's in there now, which was stamped. So I'm gonna repeat the process. Now I can press down much harder. The firmer you press on the pedal, the stronger the bite is, the more aggressive the, the bending is. So, if you think about it, you can really finesse how you want this machine to work. 
Okay, so now I'm stepping on it pretty good. Okay, Now you can see that it's starting to create that bend. And when you have a full bite, literally from, from the full length of the bend, once you've established or orientated that metal to do what it is you want it to do, then it's okay to start taking nibs. Nibs again are a portion, a por nibs are a portion of a bite, not a full bite but they're more aggressive. So the less metal you bite, the more aggressive the bending action tends to be. Okay, so now that I have that orientated, I can take nibs and it'll really move fast. So there's multiple angles on this as far as how you can create this. And this is something that just takes a lot of practice. You really manipulate metal. Okay, so now you can see it's starting to really create that curvature, okay? So what you would look at is a full bite, full orientation of the metal. And then you go back and take a smaller bite and create more aggressive turns. Also, depending on how many times you, you move it down the line when you're biting, it creates or reduces the amount of movement as well. So there's multiple ways to controlling how this bend is. Okay, I already know where I need to be on this, so I'm gonna make one more pass on this and then I'll double check it on the car. When it comes to shrimp or stretchers, you, you don't have to buy the most expensive piece of equipment out there. Um, this is a relatively inexpensive uh, import unit, if you will. And in the entire thing, I probably have 300 bucks tied into it, but yet this is something we use almost daily. Now, if this was something that broke a lot, then obviously I'd probably go with an American made or a higher quality made one like in Germany or something. But this thing hasn't failed us and I've had this for what, eight years. So it's 300 bucks well spent. start to make these pieces we prefer to exaggerate the overall dimensions of it the reason is is it gives us an opportunity to trim it down and really match the shaping now the piece of metal that we're making is actually on a 90 degree bend but the actual window frame itself is less than that okay so we're gonna have to take some of the bend out of it eventually we always do it this way because it's easier to create our shaping on a 90 degree, whereas if it was more open, it would be a little more difficult to control that bend. So, you know, it's the lesser of two evils in this case. So we go to a 90 degree, create our bend, our curvature that we want, and then we'll go back, take some of the bend out of it, then we'll relief cut it, and then we'll create some of the fold action, which you'll see later. Okay, so we're getting close to wrapping up making this uh, quarter window piece, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. And I do realize most of you probably won't have the convenience of a brake and, and some of the more uh, focused tools to do this job. Um, but, you know, a little bit of an ingenuity and cleverness, you can probably come up with a concept that works. Through the years of doing these, we've learned that what's oftentimes been the best thing to do is try to make this in one piece. This is a lot of what's called uh, double and triple back braking. In other words, there's, if you look at this on profile, one brake, two brake, three brakes. Okay, that's a triple back, triple back braking. Okay, and that can get pretty, uh, 
pretty difficult to do. The reason that's difficult to do is because it has to be fairly precise. If any one of these brakes are off, the whole weld will look shifted or sunken into the process. Um, and also, I try to pick up as much of the actual rusted area as possible. There's a rule of thumb in this. When you're making repairs to rusted areas, you want to go at least a half inch past the damage because when metal rusts, it doesn't rust literally just to the perimeter of what you're seeing. It's kind of like a, a, a tapering effect. The metal's thinned out over a larger span than just what you see. So um, that's why this is a little more uh, of a cutout than what we really would need, but this way we know we're getting past the damage. Um, again, yeah, we use a brake, we use a shrinker and a stretcher to create this piece, and you know, it takes you know a couple hours to create it, but the other option would have been is to make this out of several different pieces. The reason we don't want to make a bunch of pieces is because that's a lot of grinding when you're done welding it in. And the thing of it is, is, is I want to be able to put a weld through primer on the back of this to make this as one piece, okay? That will minimize any rusting opportunities that this could create for us. Now, the other thing you should probably keep in mind is, is that um, this radius right here, right where the rear of the quarter window comes into closing, has to be really accurately done. If it's a little short or if it's turned in a little bit, that window isn't going to clear and it's not going to open, okay? Um, that fitment of the window relationship to this corner is really tight, okay? So if anything, you'd rather have this, what we call the open splayed, you know, where it's a little more curved out um, just to ensure that that window clears. So a good rule to do is just get this lightly tacked in put the quarter window in, make sure that it's going to open and close and clear this corner, and then you should be okay. Okay, so this is kind of a wrap up on how this piece works, okay? Um, I, what I don't want to do is I don't want to leave you with the impression that this is a fairly easy thing to do because it does take quite a bit of time, an awful lot of patience, and a, a good deal of practice before you probably demonstrate something like this on your car. Um, but I do want to recap on a couple of things. If you have to do something this complex, again, make sure you over-exaggerate the amount of metal you need so you make sure that you're clearing all the, the rust you can't see. Because again, if there is pinhole rust, you have to assume that you need to go at least a half inch past the end limits of the damage, okay? Um, so with that said, this is where we're at. This piece is done. It's roughed in. We still have a little more grinding to do to clean up the welds. And then we're going to move on to other things. Like, for example, we're going to start working on the window repairs. These window repairs are kind of cool, and they're simple when you have a shrink, a shrink stretcher. Um, for example, this piece right here, this is a, a, a double bend, okay? It's about, I don't know, we'll call that roughly 110, 120 degree angle, because that's what the, the, uh, the window frame is. Anyway, so because you have a curvature, you have curvature this way and a curvature this way, you get to do two things. You get to stretch this metal, basically fanning it out, all right, to create that curve. And then this curve is on the shrinker side as you create the bending up effect. Um, Doing things on a shrinker stretcher are really easy once you have the, the understanding how it works down, okay? Um, if you have a great deal of metal you have to replace on your car, think about buying a shrinker stretcher setup versus trying to do this by hand. You can get you a fairly cheap setup at your local cheap tool store for a couple hundred bucks. You might think that's an awful lot of money, but here's the thing. If you sent your car to somebody to have all those window frame repairs done, it's going to be a whole lot more than what these simple tools would cost you, and you get the pride of being able to do it yourself.
include some of the uh, the showings of how to make some of the window frame repairs that are very common on these cars. Um, again, I don't want to simplify the approach. I don't want you to get the impression this is just a real easy thing to do because, quite frankly, it isn't. It is something you can handle, though. I'm quite confident if you have a little bit of patience and certainly a lot of time on your hands where you think you can handle something like this, go for it. What are you going to lose? If you have a lot of window frame repairs, it's very justifiable to get a shrinker stretcher um, and really start to do some stuff at, at your home. Um, but effectively, I don't want to leave the impression that it's a, it's a cakewalk. It's far from it. It does take quite a bit of skill and it does take a lot of patience. Um, the, the stuff you saw that I did, it, in real time, it took about uh, a little over a day to do all the metal work. Um, so, and, and I've done this a thousand times. Uh, whereas, if you're not familiar with working with those tools, and you're not really familiar with how to approach this, it may take you upwards of probably a week to do it at your own level. But there's a certain level of sense of accomplishment you get when you do stuff like this. Um, but um, we're going to kind of pause on this car for a little while. We're, we have other things we need to go forward with. Um, we just want to take an opportunity to share with you how to do some simple metal repairs. Um, uh, the preceding videos that you're going to see from here are probably going to be us installing the air conditioning on a uh, very expensive uh, car that we're in current build stage of. Um, we have a lot of cool things we're going to get back into that we kind of put a pause to. Um, we're going to get back on the Nagaro Blue, which is an Audi Blue car starts doing some final assembly work on that. I think there's a lot there that um, you could take value from, especially if you had somebody do the, the work for you and you're doing all the assembly work yourself. So there's probably a few things you'll learn from that if you haven't done that before. We can take the intimidation out of that. Um, the other things we're going to start focusing on here in the next few weeks is you're going to start seeing me get back on my Super. Um, my Super is a fairly good car, but it did have its own fair share of rust. But because it was a one-owner car and it never left the city of Seattle until I got it, um, I was very excited to own it. Um, so we have a lot of things we're going to be doing with that car. So between that, the GTC that we need to get back on, and a few other of these little prize gems that we haven't really shown you before, we have a lot of good videos coming up. Well, again, we have uh, the rest of the move to contend with. Um, we're maybe, maybe one-fifth of the way there on the move. Um, so videos will be sporadic, but uh, they are coming.